Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to some more Warhammer 40k lore. Where today, we are going to have a look at the Witch Cults of Komorog, where gladiatorial sports and occasional fetishism is taken to its natural conclusion. And whilst I must admit that does sound like a pretty slap in Saturday night, it's not all just fun and games as the nightly excesses of the gladiatorial arena scattered all throughout Komrog are a vital part of keeping civic order, oh, <laughs> civic order, uh, more like keeping the nightly murders to an acceptable level. Normally, of course, this wouldn't be necessary in any sane civilization, but this is the Dark Eldar we are talking about here, a species of creatures that literally feed of pain and suffering. As you can probably imagine, the nightlife gets awfully rowdy awfully quickly. This became a genuine and real threat to Komorog's continued existence in the early years of the Dark City, as its inhabitants slowly grew to understand the need to feed off the life energy of others, and that pain and suffering provided an even better meal, they quickly began turning upon the only immediate source of aforementioned sustenance, each other. You see, organizing real space raids is difficult. Even in modern day Komorog, only the largest and most successful of cabals can organize continuous outings into real space to bring in new slaves and de facto fodder, back in the earliest days when the galaxy was also a bit more of a sparsely populated place shall we say, it was even more difficult. As a way to start dealing with this problem, many of the emerging power structures, the early proto-cabals, began putting on various shows and displays of violent excess to curb the urges of their energetic populace. This proved so successful that what originally started out as impromptu poorly organized bouts of occasional entertainment have turned into a core pillar of Dark Eldar society, wherein the modern day city of Komorog, hundreds if not thousands or tens of thousands of arenas scattered all throughout the city cater to every level of Dark Eldar society. The proper arenas, of course, a host to the most exclusive elements of Dark Eldar society. Archons, war leaders, captains, and those with uh, more money than sense, whereas various other mid-tier arenas provide similar if more subdued and humdrum entertainment to the masses of Komorog. In fact, he might even go so far as to say that at this point, Bloodsport is simply yet another utility. But why? Because, I mean, as fun as people fighting to the death undoubtedly is, especially in the far future with all manners of fancy ass toys to inhabit the arena with, not to mention a wide selection of Xeno's beasties, surely there's more to this than simple entertainment, and yes, of course, you are absolutely correct. When we say that the Dark Eldar feed of pain and suffering, we mean that in the most literary sense possible. They don't just enjoy it, they're not just connoisseurs of BDSM or anything, they literally use pain and suffering to refuel their own dwindling souls being eaten away steadily by Slanesh, she who thirsts. Without access to this uh, entertainment, they would very swiftly turn into living undead husks, drained of all vitality and life force. Very uncomfortable way to go, I'm sure, and thusly of course the Dark Eldars will go to excessive lengths to make sure they have access to this sustenance. And as I am sure you can imagine, it is considerably more beneficial for the high ruling lords of Komorog to have their populace pay for access to it rather than simply shiving each other in dark alleys. This has also led to a great deal of cabals and witch cults entering into lucrative alliances and their relationships between one another is quite fascinating, but we're getting a bit ahead of ourselves. So let's begin by actually talking about what a witch cult is, <laughs> before we skip the point of the video completely. 
So, a witch cult is a gladiatorial organization. It tends to be fairly large, though it has no set organizational structure in terms of size. Usually there are um, a few thousand individuals, the largest may number in the tens of thousands, potentially even hundreds of thousands, but the rapid rate of attrition plus the exacting standards required probably means that they are at most 10, 20, 30,000, and most of them are probably hanging around the low thousands to sub thousands. Another requirement for being a proper witch cult is also access to an arena. This is their home ground, their base, their area of operations, training, logistics, and all the other requirements of a, well, de facto army, essentially. As, make no mistake, the witches' cults are not just entertainers, they are also expert warriors and frequently take part in real space raids. The largest ones even organize their own entire outings, but we'll get back to that again. Back to the whole explaining what a witch cult thing is. See, this is the problem with the more expansive topics. I have a habit to ramble, but anywho, the arenas themselves are also a symbol of the witch cult's status. How large it is, how well furnished it is, how embellished it is, etc, etc, etc. This is also a way for the Archons to show their own power by making sure that their cults, that they are in alliances with, have the largest, grandest arenas imaginable. Though not all are grand or large, in fact I would imagine that the overwhelming majority of them would be more... well... Imagine a apartment complex, for example. Large, blocky, bunches of neon lights, probably Eastern Berlin whorehouse style kind of stuff. As most witch cults will not be so lucky as to enjoy the steady patronage of a major archon or a cabal, meaning that they need to continue a living based upon the earnings that they themselves can gather via, well, de facto ticket sales, essentially. <laughs> ticket sales. I don't know why, but the idea of selling tickets in, in the modern context of little slips of paper to gain access to the murder fests. <laughs> it's just... It's a delicious mix of the, the very modern and the, uh, the rather savage, shall we say. Now, the audiences too are a big deal. Again, any aspiring witch cult is probably not going to have access to the patronage of an Archon, and so they are going to have to compete with hundreds if not thousands of other cults, probably even in the relative same area, for those customers. This means that the witches' cults are very, very, very competitive when it comes to their performances. Considering that they have nightly shows, most of them, though I would presume that not all of them have the capacity to carry out nightly shows, considering the amount of, you know, slaves and stuff that I would undoubtedly devour, though who knows, they do need to continuously remain innovative, because any witch cult that remains stuck in a rut for too long will undoubtedly get outpaced by the new hot thing, though some of the largest and most well-established of the cults have indeed specialized into certain forms of entertainment, be it fighting with, um, with, with knives, be it unarmed fighting, be it fighting with poison or gas, or particularly art-like methods of executions, but most have not achieved this level of fame. You know, this is a this is a specialized thing. It's word of mouth. If you like this, you need to go to these guys, because they're the best at that and so on. The ways in which the various witch cults compete can take on a wide variety of forms. The most obvious is of course competing to put on the bestest, the biggest, and the most awesomely innovative show. Be it using um, special performers, or special restrictions, or special challenges. Say for example, uh, one witch elf fighting with both hands tied behind her back so she's only allowed to use her legs with a pair 
pair of, um, maybe talons attached to her toes in some fanciful way, for example. Or one which going up against a particularly fierce predator or a bunch of fierce predators. Alternatively, it might also be the utilization of particularly unique or potentially disadvantageous weapons. Seeing somebody get stabbed is a pretty common occurrence in Dark Eldar society, so that's not really all that interesting. Now, seeing somebody get stabbed with a cat that has been frozen in liquid nitrogen, a considerably more, um, unique, shall we say, and is therefore likely to draw a larger crowd. Challenge is another good way to draw in the masses as well. Watching a witch elf disembowel a group of helpless imperial citizens is you know, fun and games to begin with, and you can surely spice it up through a variety of means, but it's an exceptionally one-sided fight, isn't it? Now, what would really be interesting is putting the witches up against a a hero, something something special, a uh, a Tyranid life form, for example. Those are interesting. Or Space Marines. Space Marines go for a ridiculously high premium in Comorog because they nearly always guarantee hefty fights. Or various other champions. Um. <laughs> I was about to say Tau there, and then I thought to myself, hold on, would Tau be interesting to fight in any way whatsoever? Actually, you know what? Yes, it would. Um, the Sniper versus the Lone Knife-Armed Witch. Mm -hmm. Make a big, nice little city-style panorama. Very urban combat -y. Send in the Tau, obviously. You attack him so that the audience can always know where he is, but the Witch has no idea. And so you get to watch this, this tense duel between the lone knife-armed witch and the Tau sitting somewhere with his pulse rifle and a bunch of bullshit, maybe even drones, because the more unfair it is, the more interesting it is. Might also be a uh, good way of getting rid of witches that have pissed off those higher up on the hierarchy as well. And this also, of course, offers yet another way to stand out from the crowd. This kind of a sniper duel would be quite interesting, but you can't do it too many times, so maybe you then take the Tau and you uh, you put him back in the, the tank for a little while. Maybe next up, instead, you bring on a bunch of, of humans, but pumped to the gills full of various combat-enhancing stimulants, and you simply have an enormous, bloody, gory mush pit of absolute violence, with half a dozen witch cult gladiatrixes and a few hundred batshit insane drugged up lunatics. You know, you gotta change it up ever so often. But the uh, attentive of you may also have noticed that I mentioned competing specifically in the arena, because, well, this is the Dark Eldar we are talking about here. And there are many alternative ways to get rid of intransigent competition. Raiding the competition and stabbing all of them whilst they're asleep in their bunks is one such way. Though this is usually frowned upon. The lesser cults can get away with it because they don't really have that large of an audience to please. In fact, it might even be seen as a particularly refreshing halftime show. You know, a bit of a rivalry between two competing witch cults. Whereas amongst the larger cults, this is very much so frowned upon because it, um, well, it interrupts the show, doesn't it? If you attack a rivaling cult and both of the cults lose half of their performers, you're gonna have a lot of very, very angry patrons. A lot of very heavily armed angry patrons who might decide that, you know what would be really fun? To shoot a lot of gladiatrixes. Mm. Yes, indeed. Don't mess with sport fans. They, um, they can tend to be quite, um, aggressive when peeved. And they don't just enter into hooligan mode when one witch cult decides to try and murder the other. Any interruption of services that lasts for too long, or say, for example, if the entertainment gets a little bit too boring, might provoke a quite 
vociferous response from the audience. And uh, we're not talking about a, a boycott here. So the witch kilts are in a near constant struggle to keep their audience happy, to keep them entertained, and to keep them in their arenas rather than the competitors. This is an expensive business, and the witch cults undoubtedly devour tremendous quantities of resources every single day, every single show. We're talking about thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of slaves that need to be acquired from somewhere. And a variety of slaves too. You've got of course your good old fashioned average human, maybe some towels for a little bit of blueberry surprise, some elder, mmm, now there's a valuable commodity most certainly, maybe some space marines, some good spice, and vast holding pits for various Xenos monsters, animals, or even potentially more interesting life forms with uh, peculiar um, capabilities. One could, for example, have a witch dropped into an enormous tank filled with venomous insects and then seeing if she's able to uh, cut, slice and dice her way out of there faster than one of them manages to sink an envenomed talon or tail into her supple exposed flesh. Not to mention, of course, all of the technological doodads that they might require. There is one of these witches' cults, the... what was it again? Cult of the Red Grief, I wanna say? Their entire shtick is that their arena is an enormous Hit, just a massive hole in Komarog, leading down into whatever space and time bending nonsense that the city is built on inside of the webway. The gladiatorial combat takes place suspended over this pit. Frequently on very, very, very thin platforms, sometimes on even invisible platforms, or you might have witches fighting on literal just strands of cables strung all over it. One of their more popular numbers is also using the Hellions. These are the crazy Dark Eldar on the jet uh, skateboard things with weapons flying around the arena at ridiculous speeds whilst unspooling long strands of filament wire from behind their little fancy ass jet skateboards, covering the arena in razor sharp threads. Whilst everyone's speeding around a hundred odd kilometers on a jet skateboard. Hmm. Yes, uh, not only expensive, but also exceedingly bloody, no doubt. And of course, we're not even just talking about the, the holding cells, the weapons, the equipment, the all of the slaves. Imagine, too, the amount of food required to keep these places running. Oh, good golly. Logistical Nightmare 101. In fact, I'd love to see a video game about this now. The more I think about it, and starting out as a tiny little witch cult, building your way all the way up to the top, competing with the biggest and the grandest, now that could be fun. And a lot of logistical management too. <laughs> That's my sense of video games. Would you like to be in the arena fighting? No, I'd like to take care of the logistics, please. Now, give me another 10,000 slaves and enough wedgies for all of them. Anywho, you've also of course got the living quarters of the witch cult gladiatrixes themselves. And you'll want to keep them happy considering they're all psychopathic trained murderers, but you also want to give them incentive. Bigger and better rooms, the bigger and better you perform, obviously. You also need vast and extensive training quarters to accommodate a wide variety of weapons, fighting styles, environments, yada 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 a literal mountain of various logistical tasks. Now, a lot of this is obviously, hopefully, going to be paid for by the ticket sales. But the larger and more successful cults will also be able to take part in real space raids, and this is a treasure trove in virtually every imaginable way. The Archons, of course, carry out these raids for generalized riches and wealth, primarily slaves, which can then be sold on to the rest of the populace and the witch cults at a considerable premium. For the witch cults, however, it's so much more than that. 
The opportunity to go on a real space raid gives them a chance to record some of their excesses, and many of the witch cults do this as well and then presumably sell it on de facto DVD later, whilst also capturing a wide variety and wealth of slaves, which they can get for, well, de facto free, or at the very least, on the down low. And many witch cults, the more uh, expert amongst them, even get paid to come along on particularly ambitious raids organized by up-and-coming archons. It also presents a plentiful opportunity to raid other riches like technologies, interesting uh, flowers, flora, ingredients for uh, exotic toxins or combat stims, and interesting weapons. There are many cool and retarded little alien species scattered throughout the galaxy, many of which might have fascinating ways of fighting that could be turned into new and interesting plays for nightly entertainment. It's also a rare opportunity to try and get a hold of something truly interesting, something dangerous, something exotic to bring back home. Uh, maybe, again, particularly ferocious predators, uh, large orc warbosses, again, space marines, um, Eldar Autarchs, mm, now there's a real little treat right there. Or maybe something more fanciful, like those various little lesser Xeno species that have nevertheless developed a, uh, a bit of a society of their own. I imagine bringing in some corals, for example, would be very interesting. Or those um, orangutan-looking things. What was, um, Jucarios? Jucaros? Jucaros? Something like that. The orangutan-looking bastards that are super good at all kinds of technology. They could make sort of some interesting performances, absolutely. This is also a way to gain the favor of up-and-coming Archons, or the eye of already established Archons and Cabals as well, as you prove that the Witch Cult is a valuable asset in real space raids and military operations, potentially even against uh, other competitors. Now, the largest and most successful of the witch cults out there, like for example, again, the Cult of Strife, might be so large, so wealthy, and so well organized as to be able to organize their own raids, even without the additional backing of an Archon. And this is where the real money can be earned, as now they'll get all the loot, all the slaves, all the fancy weapons, all the champions, all the cool-ass nonsense they can carry, and they get to sell tickets to this too. Oh yes, some of the more extravagant outings are offered up to the richest, the wealthiest, the most influential influential, influential, English, members of Dark Eldar society, and they allow them to tag along, to see the experience, the performance up front from a semi-safe perspective. Those of lesser means, but nevertheless fairly well off, might pay to fight alongside the witches cults. Kind of, imagine of a kind of like, um... This is not a one-to-one -one example, but it works good enough. Imagine, for example, being able to purchase a ticket to go and play a football match alongside Manchester United or Liverpool or Chelsea or any of these big-name football clubs, for example. You'd probably pay a lot of money for the opportunity to do something like that. Now imagine that the football club is also staffed with nothing but super hot space elves. Yeah, those tickets come at a premium, even though in this case of the, the lower class tickets, you're going to have to fight literally for your own survival whilst trying to take in the experience all around you. And I can guarantee the witch elves will not be particularly peeved or annoyed if you end up dead. If anything, that's just more weapons and armor for them to bring back home. If a cult ever reaches this level, then it has absolutely made it, and only the most extreme of misfortune or falls from grace could possibly topple them from their lofty pillar. Not impossible, but very, very, very rare. But 
it's not so easy. Not only is getting into real space hard, not to mention the fact that you're going to need ships, you're probably going to need a lot more in the way of, uh, you know, proper weaponry, especially if you want to bust open something heavy. Raiding an agricultural world in a quick hit and run, sure, but a proper performance against something like a hive planet or something is going to require more than a pair of knives or some fanciful theatrical weaponry, of course. It's also going to require a great deal of larger scale organization. You are going to need to bring along the transport capacity for the prisoners. You are going to have to bring along gaolers. You're going to have to bring along food to keep them fed and watered whilst you are capturing them. You are going to have to bring along transports and prison barges to bring them up to the ships. Not to mention, you're of course going to need to organize an actual army and strike out against an opposition that is probably able to defend itself in a military fashion. Now the ranks within the witch cults can be complex and baffling in the extreme. They do have a handful of um, badges of office, shall we say, or positions within the hierarchy. Uh, for example, there is the, the Hecatrix. This is the de facto squad leaders, the middle management of the witcher's cult. They take command of smaller groupings of witch elves, whence they wander- witch elves? I bet you have already called them Dark Elves like seven times in this video, and I'm definitely going to do so now that I've thought about it, but... <sighs> yes, witches. Um, into combat in an organized fashion. Again, being all fanciful is all well and good in the arena, but in an actual war, there are cases where tactics and strategy needs to take precedence. The Hecatrixes themselves also have a very intricate pecking order within their own hierarchy, as they are all competing for the favor and, indirectly, the positions of the highest ranking members of a witch cult, the so-called succubuses, or if you prefer, the considerably harder to pronounce Inyatich. Each cult has three of these succubuses, no I'm not going to say the other word again, that completely dominate the entire cult and rule over it as a triumvirate, though in reality, in most cases, only one of them wield actual genuine decision making power, and it is usually a popularity contest. Whichever one of the three is currently the most popular with the crowds is the one that really carries all the power, as she is the one dictating the, uh, the performances, the odds that witches will be placed up against, and also the one that commands the favour of the crowd, and could potentially turn it against her sisters, whilst raising up a competitor to take her place. Unsurprisingly, there's a fair bit of politicking going on within the ranks of the succubuses, though there's also a great deal of violence within the ranks of the succubuses, as, well, office politics is all well and good, but a good old-fashioned knife to the face tends to settle most disputes in a far more conclusive fashion, and, even better, a fight between succubuses out in the arena with some special rules thrown in for shits and giggles. That's a crowd pleaser right there, and as I'm sure I've already impressed upon you, crowd pleasers are an absolute necessity for the witch cult's continued success. And now, finally, let's dwell a bit further upon one of the, the greatest achievements of this success, a real sign that you are on the up and up. An alliance, a deal, a treaty, a compact, whatever you might call it, with a major cabal, with an archon. This provides the witch cults with a tremendous amount of benefits. Archons are universally powerful, high-ranking, wealthy individuals that wield coffers the likes of which the witch cult could not even dream of. They are the ones who are organizing dozens of real space raids every year, bringing back hundreds of thousands and millions upon millions of slaves. They're also the ones literally in charge of vast sections of the city of Komrog. They're the ones with all the real estate to be used for large, impressive, and attractive arenas. An alliance with one is extraordinarily important. 
but this is where competition enters the field yet again. The Archon, of course, this is not a completely one-sided deal. The Witch Cults will also provide a great deal of prestige to the Archon. Because here's the thing, if Archons are indeed these ludicrously rich individuals with tremendous personal armies with entire fleets at their disposal, how can they measure amongst one another? What sets one Archon apart from the next Archon? Of course, in the more extreme cases, like Asdrubal Vect himself, it's rather obvious, but most Archons, it's, well, what's the difference between Billionaire A and Billionaire B? Well, Billionaire B owns a football club. <laughs> basically. And the more prestigious, the more impressive, the more ridiculous the exploits of the witch cult, the better it reflects on their partner Archon. And of course, the better they fare in Warfare 2, the better they'll be able to help out in real space raids. It's also here where the Archon's uh, generosity, their beneficent, comes into question. Because once you've got a really good witch cult, you've got to keep it. And the cult itself, of course, as is common in Dark Elder society, in fact is practically a virtue, will always be on the lookout for a better offer. If another Archon can offer a slightly more impressive arena, or a slightly higher cut of the profits and the plunder, oh, there's nothing stopping them from switching sides. It's not like allegiance or loyalty are good things in Dark Elder society, and in fact it is an exceedingly rare occurrence for a witch cult and an Archon to maintain a long-standing alliance. This is again what makes the Cult of Strife as alliance with the Black Heart Cabal so very, very unique as it is um, essentially a bit of a, a power couple combination between a pair of the most powerful and influential individuals in the entirety of Dark Eldar society, Lilith Hesperex and Asdrubael Vect. Very, very big ass names indeed. It also, of course, provides a great deal of protection. And this is where the political game comes into focus. Let's say that you've got a, a witch cult ally to Cabal A, and they get a better offer from Cabal B, but better yet, now Cabal A is without a witch cult of their own. They no longer have a tremendous stable of trained professional killers under their command, which might make it a lot easier for Cabal B to encourage others to take up arms to take over a little bit of territory that really should have been redistributed a long time ago, you know? It can be a rapid swing in the political and military favorabilities of the various factions on Komorog, depending upon where the witch cults go. In turn, of course, as well, a cabal can use its influence against a witch cult and divest itself of it, whilst also making it very clear that if you pick up this witch cult, well, now you're my enemy, so you better goddamn not. A witch cult that has been used and accustomed to the, uh, the excesses of their patrons' beneficent might find it suddenly damnably hard to do business well, deprived of all of that lucrative income and all of those slaves. It's always nice to see a bit of beautiful symbiosis, isn't it? And with all of that, hopefully, you have a bit of a better understanding of what a witch cult is in the 41st millennium. And it gives me an idea for another video too. How exactly a witch cult launches an invasion slash raid on a world. Hmm. Later. Until next time, I've been Arch. Thank you all very much for watching, and I hope to see you all again soon. Till then, have a good day.